Um, my name is Elliot Montague and uh, I joined the Sierra Club in 1959 when I was an apprentice in the railways uh, and it wasn't a very nice place to work really. I spent six months in, a, in the, the tender that gets dragged behind the locomotive, chipping the, chipping the uh, rust off. But I used to sit down in the back of the workshops uh, for lunch by myself and I could see Boeing 727 going over the top, sparkling in the sun. I thought this will do me. So uh, this time I was doing three nights a week and Saturday morning, associate chip in mechanical engineering. So I um, had to do a correspondence course for the, uh, the um, to get qualified to go through to the video job. And that sounded pretty good, but chippies that day, they cost uh, five pounds an hour, and we got, in the first year, we got six pounds 50 a week. So it was a pretty slow business. Uh, Dad was a house painter, so he couldn't help. He had four kids. I was one of them, obviously. Um, anyway, I've got a picture of myself in 1959 uh, in Perth Airport, wherever we were then. and. Uh, hiding the log book with a pen and ink. You know, they used to make the ink with a, whatever it was, powder. Or, uh, so, luckily we're past that. Uh, I've got a few names I'll just mention as we go along. People you might know that were here there, the people I knew, Alex Henry, oh, yeah. Bill yeah. Burney. Yeah. Alex has passed on, if you're not aware. Um, <laughs> Bill Burney, uh, he's gone too. Jerry Robinson, Ron Graham, Brian Saw, Kingsley Hughes, Cliff Holmes, Bruce Stewart, etc. Uh, when I was told, when, when I went to be tested to see if I could go for the, uh, the commercial licence, the instructor at the Arrow Club said, oh, you need another 10 hours general handling. Well, that was, that was just out of the question, you know, in, in my uh, situation. Uh, but luckily I had a girlfriend and she'd been saving money which was good and she came up with a hundred pounds and I feel a bit guilty I never paid her back <laughs> but, but I did marry her so that was, was alright yeah um, <laughs> yeah so uh, having done that the job the thing then was to get a job so what do you do to get a job get dressed nicely, you can go into the city and anything that looks like a got an aeroplane on the front of it, go in and say, any work. So down at um, the terrace, there was um, MMA and uh, uh, Ken, um, Ken Cohen was the fellow they sent me to see. And uh, he said, look, have you got Morse code? And I said, no, I haven't. And he said, we've got a a DC3 course starting in uh, a week. If you've got your Morse code in a week, you've got a job. And I thought, wow, this is good. Um, I was a bit lucky because I had my commercial license and the, my mates, they sort of said, don't waste your time because, you know, there's nothing happening in the West and all the rest of it. But, uh, of course, we started MKM and MKMO and all those people started up and they were looking for pilots. So I went to do my Morse code, which is a pain in the butt. And uh, so you'd have a, uh, a, a uh, whatever it was then, tape I suppose, sit in the room with your headset on and you know, practice, practice, practice. Uh, so I was ready. I did the exam and halfway through the exam, knock, 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 guy opens the door and said, oh, sorry mate, shuts the door and of course you lost it. So, um, I of course, failed that. So I went and saw Ken Curran again and told him what happened. And he said, look, I'll give you another two days. If you're ready then, you've got a job. And uh, I, luckily, I was ready. And uh, so that was uh, onto the DC3 course uh, with a few guys. And uh, so um, you've probably heard of uh, Colin Cook, who was a pilot with us, and um, he did my endorsement, and uh, 
of course, uh, Colin Cook was a bit of a wild bugger. Um, and there was a lot of this punching on the shoulders and punching in the ribs and blah, 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 and, you know. And uh, anyway, I, I did my bit, but I just couldn't get it right. What we used to do was set power and you'd uh, jack the thing down with flaps. And um, he, he taxied in and said, that's enough, you're flying with MMA, it's finished, get out. So he opened the door and I got out and uh, then he, he shut down the left hand engine and yelled out, where are you going, you know, blah, blah, blah. Come back tomorrow, I'll see if we can do anything with you. In fact, I did his last um, trip with him to Darwin and told him what a prick he was. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> the silly thing is, is Ray Hosking, anybody know Ray? Yeah, yeah. Ray and myself, we did his last trip. And I don't know why he did it. We all went down the beach and he said, Righto, all get your gear off, we're going for a run. So we had to go for a run down the beach. It wasn't a very pretty sight, I'll tell you now. The three blokes running down the beach and back with no gear on. Uh, anyway, he said, oh, things are pretty tough then. Now, what are we doing here? Um, yeah, so I passed the endorsement, passed the line training, and then they sent me to Darwin for two years, where we had our first child. Um, might know Russ Carrick, Jim Hilda, Erwin McKillop were the captains up there. Um, Erwin McKillop was a name that uh, went through history a little bit. He was unintentionally uh, Instrumental in, instrumental in basically changing the way pilots acted with each other in Australia in the cockpit. You may be aware he was in East West. He uh, had a uh, flight out of Sydney, runway 07, a night flight, and uh, he was he had a first officer with him, of course. The weather was fine. Uh, there was a cloud about 700 feet. Anyway, they got going and uh, the DC-3 used to make a couple of power changes. Then I think we only made one before we went to climb power. And uh, when he pulled the uh, throttles back, the thing started uh, backfiring. And he pushed it forward again and it stopped and pulled it back again and it started again. So he just feathered the engine. Um, Throttle close, feather it, and uh, he found the aeroplane wasn't really climbing very well at all. So uh, he thought we'd better get back. He wanted to do a, a, a UE and land on, on the runway reciprocal of the runway he took off on. But as he was turning, he found the uh, aeroplane was sinking and he wasn't going to make it. And he saw the if you're familiar with 07 in Sydney, there's a big lake on the right hand side. He uh, went for the lake, landed in the lake, and uh, nobody was hurt, but apparently it really affected him. He visited people who were um, in the hospital just for checking, you know, to see if they were okay and all that stuff. There was a lady with a baby, and etc. etc. But of course, when at the end of all that, um, it was the beginning of where there were two pilots in the cockpit and they would help each other. And uh, we got to the situation where they were taught about uh, V1, VR and takeoff weights and uh, takeoff uh, uh, numbers and all the rest of it. And uh, from then on, people had to learn to act as a crew. So you'll see now, like if it's an engine engine failure in flight, first thing the captain will say, confirm number one fail. Put his hand on the on the fuel cutoff, and the other guy has a look and says confirmed, and then he'll say cut off. And he'll say, well, start with throttle. Number one throttle, confirmed. He says confirmed, boom, closed. And then fuel control valve, number one, confirmed, closed. So uh, that's how it all started. and. Uh, it took a while, apparently, for captains to uh, not be the man only, you know, whatever he said goes. And uh, I think that uh, Irwin never, never sort of knew that that's really where it all started. 
Uh, so he was he was a good guy in Darwin, but uh, Herbert always sort of got it wrong in some ways. I remember we went out to Bill and Gimme one day. Uh, that was a uh, out over towards Groot Island, and normally before we left, we would ring up Bill and Gimme and get, get the forecast. What's how's, what's the weather like over there? Nobody answered the phone. Uh, so we went anyway, and when we got there, we could we knew why they uh, there was no one there because they couldn't get over the river. It was raining. Eventually they came, and uh, we weren't in it weren't in a good spot. Unloaded the aircraft and all the rest of it, and he said, "You are leave, away we go." And I did the takeoff, but of course I don't know what the speed was, probably 60 knots or something. And things started going you know, sideways, so I just gave it away and. Then when we tried to taxi again, the thing wouldn't move. We are in the mud. So uh, by then the fellows were over the, over the uh, river and all these, they brought some ropes and all these Aboriginal blokes, there you know, must have been hundred of them, I don't know how many, but put the ropes on the oleos and pulled us back onto the area where it wasn't as bad. Uh, in fact, you could, you know, the tyres were pretty well sitting on top. We had to wait hours and then we got away. And sort of, uh, Irwin kindly said, oh, the FO did a good job and all this crap. And he got a letter saying, you shouldn't let the first officer do stuff like that, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, he's one of those sort of guys. He, um, I don't know whether it was true or not, but I've been told that he's in a 7-3. He went up somewhere up north. 737 and uh, let the first officer land the 73 on a wet runway and the guy sort of floated and floated and put it on the runway and uh, you know, the deceleration wasn't any good and everyone thought they were going to go off the end so he um, did a big you know, uh, full rudder of one inch and spun the thing around and he got the sack. So uh, I thought he died and I told somebody he died and he rang me up and said, what are you doing, blah, blah, blah. I said, oh, shit, mate, sorry. <laughs> anyway, he was, he, was, he was a good bloke. Um, Darwin was pretty good. Uh, the, um, Russ Carrick, he was, he was one of those fellows who uh, knew where all the things were happening. Like, um, we came back one day, there was a, a coming back from the station runs and there's a Catholic mission on the way about 90 miles out of Darwin and one of the engines died so we could have easily kept going but he, he went back to this mission because they have all the seafood and all these things that are going around the place because he was he used to smoke his own fish and all that stuff so I had to be storm which I was and they sent people out to fix the thing and um, he told me that uh, when he was a, a young guy, he was um, in a uh, was twin engine. Sorry. Bristol Freighter. Yeah, well, one of those things. He he was flying with uh, Lionel Van Pratt, and uh, he they they had a bloke in the front, and they were testing the new why they did the fuel system, and both the engines stopped. They're going down, and he said, "We go." We we were going into the swamp, uh, into the uh, swamp, and he could see there's a tree in front. But he thought, "I'll be okay. It's in front of him." Brad. But he said, just as they got nearly on on the ground, he pushed a bloody rudder, and the tree was in front of him. Then, so <laughs> he was pretty silly about that. Sorry, ladies. Um, so uh, he he just he said he got out and hitched the ride to Brisbane. I don't know why, but anyway, that's the sort of bloke he was. Um, Jim Hilda, he was ex-Air Force. We used to do, uh, because we didn't do any night flying, we'd pull the aeroplane out, uh, I don't know, maybe two weeks or something, and do circuits and, you know, at the night time. And Dave Scanlon was another fellow up there at the time. Uh, poor bugger died of... Uh, cancer when he was only about 50, which is a bit sad. But anyway, we uh, the DC-3 had a, a light to say the back 
either the back uh, door or, or the uh, hatch where you chuck the bags in is open. So uh, we're taxiing along, no, taxiing on the runway, and Jim said, go down the back, have a look and test, test the doors, meeting from the inside. Uh, of course, so we got up the end on the runway, ready to go. We had to hurry because there's a British Airways um, 727 or something, not 727. Uh, anyway, British Airways are trying to land. And um, so we thought, oh, gee, Dave's, we've not getting, you know, how high the, the, tail, the tail is on the, D, on the DC-3. He thought he'd drop, jumped out to have a check him out on the outside and we'd knock him over and he might be on the runway. So this guy had to go around, and we went, we went down, and there he is, running up the bloody runway. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Very embarrassing. Oh, anyway, he came back from Darwin, uh, did the F-27 course, um, and then got the sack <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> for the second, first time, and um, that was because. Uh, you know, downturn and all the rest of it. But I got back again, which was good. And um, I did my training and did my checkout. And uh, then um, I had the last, you know, the last flight I did for the second time was the, uh, the check on the line. And uh, some of the guys were being stupid on their last check. You know, the guys say, fly it as you want to, mate. The guys go down. And, 500 feet. My, t my training captain said, mate, this is the best flight you've ever done. So I did and I passed and my father-in-law was waiting for me to say my wife said I uh, lost the baby. So bad night. Uh, don't worry, we had another four, so that was pretty good. <coughs> did a bit of that and then they said, go to Tom Price for two years on the Twin Otter. So I did that and it was fun. Then came back and went on the F-28. Uh, on the F-28, I went through the training, the um, op command, and, and then a training captain, a check captain, and eventually they thought I could handle being the, um, the fellow in charge of the F-28 for Perth and Sydney, which I did, which was interesting, until Ray Hoskin. We all know Ray Hoskin. Yep, Ray took over from me when I went on the boat, 767. Um, what I'd like to have a little talk about is um, airmanship. Uh, I'm sure you all have your own ideas of what airmanship is. And you might ask yourself if you're flying, uh, if A, if you agree with me, and B, how many of these you try to do. So a good airman, would uh, have some of these attributes. And that would be flight management skills, good decision making ability, adequate stick and rudder skills. A lot of people think a good pilot is a bloke who lands nicely and, you know, has got a, perhaps a deep voice and that sort of crap, you know. <laughs> and uh, we have a few of them. Um, the ability to function under pressure, sometimes extreme. There's a lot of examples of that, blokes who lose all their engines and land in the river, or our fellow, you may not be aware that one of ours coming down to Perth, and uh, all the engines failed. And that was rather interesting because it was a night nice flight, and the captain had never, the captain flew up from Perth, the first officer was waiting for him, and the captain had never, ever, met the first officer, let alone fly with him. They took off, got up to 31,000 feet, and there was a pretty big thunderstorm out to the left. So um, they were worried about out outflow from the thunderstorm, so they turned right a little bit. Uh, but then one of the engines just pulled down to nothing. So that wasn't much of a problem. Um, but then another one went too. And then another one, and another one. As soon as the engine stop, you, you're on uh, emergency power. You've got, uh, so all the lights go out, 
Paul invited some months ago back to basic stuff, you'll find it a Cessna. Uh, and you can't maintain altitude. So they're just going downhill. Middle of the night, um, they ended up uh, going down to about four minutes to go before they actually landed in, in, in the scrub. Now, the aeroplane's unpressurised, the uh, masks are out, the lighting in the cockpit's very, very bare. They can't talk to each other on the uh, uh, oxy mask because as soon as you start a tour, you get chills. Um, as I say, basic, a basic instrumentation. Um, and so it goes on. They can get the gear down, which is good. And uh, when they got down to four minutes to touch, they, uh, and they just made a mono, of course, they got one engine going, which didn't do anything because uh, all it did was cut the sink rate down to about a thousand feet a minute. So that gave them a bit of time. And uh, then, excuse me, the, uh, they got another one going, and that improved matters, but they still weren't going to go anywhere. They were 183 nautical miles from Mika. Uh, and meanwhile, I mean, you know you're going to die if you land in a bush in Mika Thara. There's a lot of rocks there. You've got no, no landing lights or anything. And whatever, the, I don't know what the landing speed of that thing would be. It'd be about 20 knots or 30 knots or something. Uh, then they got um, the second one, they were able to slow and the descent rate even more. The third one came up and um, that they were able to just maintain altitude with that. And so they set course 186 down to Nikathara. He didn't worry about the other one, he was just happy to have that, he didn't want to stuff things up. And they got there and uh, I've written a fair bit about that, but there's a little interesting thing that got me. Um, when they had the inquiry, the bloke from the uh, company, not the company, from the regulator, okay, and the first thing he asked was, did you check the mixtures or it rich? And he, he just refused to talk to this bloke. I mean, that's terrible when you think about it, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, uh, they ended up making a uh, video of it. This the language of it was, was whatever happened, it was there. They just put the beeps in the language because apparently they said a few naughty words. Yeah. And uh, it went out throughout the world to, who, uh, to have it uh, as a video to show the troops that if you've got good procedures and the crews are trained in them, they can, even in a, a, a very tense business, they can operate. Just like the guy did in uh, uh, landing in the Hudson River. And it's true too. But when you go through some of these accidents I've got here, there's some comp companies are really not into that sort of thing. I think a lot depends on, uh, like, some, I don't know, Arabic, perhaps Japanese type places where you can't talk to a captain like you can in Australia, this sort of thing. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, the ability to function under pressure, sometimes extreme. This is what Emmett and should attribute. Um, good situa situation awareness. The ability to honestly self-assess, manage risk, handle peer pressure and external pressures. The ability to prioritise tasks and information and attend to detail to maintain an overview of the present situation. The ability to project the effect of present happenings into likely future happenings. The ability to smell a rat. <laughs> by, by this I mean uh, the ability to project the effect of present happenings into likely future happenings. I mean recognise or have a feeling or a sense that things are not going right in the right direction and having recognised this, positively stop it right there, change direction. Uh, to have personal discipline and be able to stay focused and not be distracted, to have a good knowledge of the aircraft 
meteorology of fraud, air legislation and other subjects, etc. And to understand what uh, CRM and RSM. And some of these, some of you guys, are, well, a lot of you guys, I suppose, would be private pilots or build your own aircraft and all the rest of it. Don't fall into the trap of you know, this sort of stuff doesn't matter to you. Even, even if you're the only person in the airplane, it's still important because if you prang the thing and kill yourself, you've got your family to worry about, or if you've got anybody else in, you act exactly the same as if you had 300 people down the back. I mean, we, the 767, we had, what I don't know, 300 people in a crew of 13. If we had only 20 people on board for some reason, we didn't do anything differently. It just doesn't matter how many people are there, it's the same all the time. I'm afraid that I'm only on page two. <laughs> <laughs> Do we all know about um, Eric Wise when he came to um, Australia to be the first man to uh, have controlled flight in an aeroplane in Australia? Now, Adams was a um, the headmaster of Wesley College in Melbourne. He heard that an American called Eric Wise was coming to Australia to do what I said he was going to do. He reckoned it should be a POM who's doing that. Uh, sorry, POM's an Englishman <laughs> or <a> lady. <laughs> it's so easy to offend, isn't it? No one in Australia. Um, so he couldn't get anyone. So he got a guy called Ralph Banks with his right flyer to come across to do it. So um, the idea there that you may be aware is the way you decide if it was safe to fly, you light the match, you'd hide, hold it up, if the breeze blew the, the uh, match out, it wasn't safe to fly. If it was all right, you were safe. So these two blokes brought their aeroplanes over and uh, they got in a paddock near uh, a digger's rest. The paddock's still there, there's a plaque there, and there's a uh, a uh, statue there by the station. So on the day they put the aeroplanes together, they, did, they lit the match. Lit the match. Now the fellow from England, he Ralph Wise, his match blew out, but he thought he would still fly. Um, the other guy, you, you probably know better as Houdini, he from America, he decided no, it's not safe. The other fellow who was going to fly, um, he uh, took off, he got fired hardly anywhere and pranged and broke himself off. Not him, he broke his aeroplane off. Uh, Houdini waited for 17 days and then he flew and became the first man in Australia to uh, demonstrate controlled flight in um, Australia. So that was rather interesting, I thought. Um, and when you think about what was at stake, Houdini was pretty smart not to fly the first time, whereas the other guy tried and stuffed it up. I think I waffle on too much, but I got a lot to say. Thanks for your attention, everyone.